Prado as the author of Miami Arts Explosion. He's a professor of philosophy at Miami Dade College and a lecturer in art history at the University of Miami. Uh, he's a good friend of the store, I've known for many, many years, and uh, please welcome Alfredo. First, I'd like to thank um, Mitch Kaplan and Christina for inviting me to this wonderful event. As you can see, this, is, this place is really packed with en wonderful energy. Uh, I have to say that only books and books could pull this feat. So I'm honored to introduce our uh, tonight's guest, Bernard Paulini. I'd like to begin with this baffling quote towards the end of the left in the dark times. Quote, the melancholy left versus the lyrical, the lyrical left. The choice, after all, is clear, end of quote. It's a quote that borrows from music and poetry and indicates how difficult it is to define a position when it comes to ideas. We live in the dark times, and the left is nowhere to be found unless the right place is not one, that is to say, not a utopia, May 68, it, all, it with all that, or a dystopia, which is, in a sense, the times we live right now, but a heterotopia. And I know I'm not previewing more than I'm supposed to in reference to uh, tonight's author. Bernard Henri Lévy needs no introduction, but I'll do this for the sake of making a point. Let's go back to the late 1970s when our guest is in his late 20s, a young journalist philosopher, part of a small group labeled Nouveau Philosophe, New Philosophers, who broke with the Marxist ideology and socialism at the time of the status quo of French, French intelligentsia. A young man rebelling against his own tribe can only be considered as an act of treason, something for which Henri Lévy was never forgiven. Why did he do it? I leave this as a open question for him to respond later. One thing is clear, it must be hard being expelled from heaven and at the same time being denied the comforts of hell. <laughs> but that's exactly what the right is as defined by Henri Lévy, and he didn't want any part of it. Who needs the right of anti-Semitism, of the accusers of the Dreyfus affair, the right of Charles Moir, the Bethanists of the Vichy regime, the right, and now I take the liberty of uh, uh, Henri Lévy, that might even agree with me, the greedy ban bankers of today's Wall Street, the right of Stalinism, fascism, Nazism, in, in modern guise of Islamofascism, what he calls fascislamism, and all the color combinations between red, brown, and green that the author so aptly describes. From the 1970s to the 90s, Henri Lévy kept fighting against the grain on his battle of ideas. He wrote for magazines, taught philosophy at the University of Strasbourg, and at the Col Normale. Among his, all his books, and besides the seminal barbarism with the human face, I would like to point to one that's dear to me, Ideologie Francaise, whose edition in English exists, but I haven't seen it. It's an excellent, honest, and complex book. The Century of Sartre, which is the most for Jean-Paul Sartre's lovers, and a very deep evaluation of his life, to which I must say many leftist Sartreans agree with, even in private. For a different kind of reading, there's American Vertigo, a uh, book that made him very well known in the United States, a wonderful collage of impressions of Americans following in the footsteps of that illustrious, I would say, French-American, Tocqueville. In the meantime, when you opt for self-induced exile, where do you go? Are you ready? The paradox here is that Henri Lévy may never have left the real left. Only then someone could have articulated the critique of barbarism with a human face. Perhaps Henri Lévy discovered that the left was, as witty and somewhat cryptic Adorno would say, a face that fits a circumstance. In a sense, the people's best ideas raise, rise to that circumstance. That's why in left, in dark times, he keeps pursuing moments of the best left. So there's the American left of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King the left of anti-authoritarian, anti-totalitarian side of May 68, of Pasolini's Lutheran letters, of Levinas' philosophy, of Aragon political statements, of the best, the best Saab in Aosé, of the left of solidarity, 
anti-authoritarian, anti-progress, non-dialectic left, even liberal left. Granted, when one plays with higher ideas such as these, one might get a little self-indulgent. And Henri Levy is aware of the danger. He once wrote, quote, playing with virtue is a dangerous temptation, end quote. <laughs> to read left in dark times is to enjoy our ride of idiosyncratic contempt prose, rich with metaphors, filled with personal memories, history, philosophical interjections, the voice of curious, restless thinker exposing himself, talking out loud, even at times, at the risk of erring, but saying what he needs to say and needs to be said. I thought of the essays of Baudelaire of the Salon of 1845, a bit of Sola, the caustic wit of Mencken. This book is a great read. It's also an admonition against what Sartre called mauvaise foi, against the self-indulgence and the paralysis. I take Henri Lévy's new universalization, for instance, and for a taste, this is a, a little bit of sort of a manifesto of universalism, I want to quote from, uh, a little quote from, from page 211. Uh, and this is defining a left to which I totally subscribe a left that is true to its best reflexes, a left that is logical result of its great guiding effects, of its foundational luminous images. In a word of what, at the very beginning of this book, I call the pantheon. But a left that will therefore have no other pantheon besides this one, no other heaven, even again, no more uncreated truths of any kind, no ideas that offer a full-fledged solution for what it ought to do. A left that will get used to the idea once and for all that there is no more room for building castles in the air, and that it only builds its plans on the disorders of the world, its injustices, its misery. And this is precisely the teleological, which is to say, the philosophical foundation of the political of a lesser evil, and therefore, for the better. Uh, finally, <laughs> well, I'm happy to be... <laughs> Finally, though, I'm happy to be uh, who am I in following questions linguists as a possible vicarious desire for some of us who like to empathize with other people. Let me finish this point. I think it's my most important point. Who would not even for a moment like to be someone who studied with Althusser and Derrida, met and discussed with the likes of Foucault, Deleuze, Merleau-Ponty, who is a successful journalist, author, philosophy professor, social activist, someone who knows almost every single important figure in the European intelligentsia, a public intellectual for 30 years, last but not least, an individual who dresses very sharply and has a gorgeous wife. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Bernard <laughs> It's a, no, it's a real pleasure and, and joy to, for a writer to be, to be read and to be introduced as I were during these few minutes. And uh, thank you very much from the depth of my heart.